Good morning. Come on over. Good morning, I'm Jim, Executive Director of the Institute. Sally, the Director of Music, I saw her just walk in a sec. There she is, back there. Um, welcome again this morning to this second day of the Institute. Today is the first full day of the Institute. Uh, thank you so much for the liturgies that we have experienced thus far. All of you, those who planned, those who attended, those who sang. Um, it's a helpful reminder uh, that when we are gathered together talking about the liturgy, that is secondary liturgical theology, right? Primary liturgical theology is what ha just happened in the chapel this morning and what went on last night. Um, so uh, grace to you and um, good gifts received. Uh, while we're talking about what's going on in the chapel, I just want to call to your attention um, you know, Von de Dries cover art is the original watercolor paintings are on display. Is that handmade paper? Yes. On hand, water? Okay, so, so some favorite paper, uh, some fantastic watercolors. They're on display in the chapel and Vonda has laid a sketchbook out. This is, this is risky business for artists, you know, to let you in on the process. So take a look at that. Uh, Vonda's right here. Would you stand up, Vonda? Give her a round of applause. Thank you so much for your work among us. Make sure that you talk to Vonda, even if you don't attend uh, her workshop. And know this, that she was reading uh, Jamie Smith's book, How to Inhabit Time, while she was painting. This is a lovely, lovely interaction. Um, then the other thing that I want to draw to your attention uh, is to encourage you to join the group chat. I just posted detailed descriptions of all of the workshops that are happening this morning uh, to the group chat. Um, if that technology is difficult for you, come talk to me and we'll sort you through it. Um, and then also, um, you should also know, I'm just going to call this to your attention, that uh, Fred Needner, where's Fred? Right, there he is, right there in his trademark black turtleneck. Fred Needner is uh, doing a workshop at 1045 this morning in the brown and gold room to introduce the text of tonight's cantata. Am I right? Is that, is that accurate? Okay. So if you want that introduction, brown and gold room after uh, Jamie's plenary this morning. And now to introduce our plenary speaker, my friend Travis Shaw. Yeah, you can give him a round of applause. He's a, he's a good guy. He's a good guy. Well, thank you for that, because I know I'm not the reason you're here. <laughs> give me a moment. Okay. James K.A. Smith holds the Gary and Henrietta Biker Chair at Calvin University, where he is a professor of philosophy. He is also the editor-in-chief of Image, a literary journal that is near to my own heart. The author of a wide range of books, I first became acquainted with Jamie's work with a little book entitled, Who's Afraid of Postmodernism? Was that your first book or no? No, but it's early. Early, early, early Jamie Smith. Um, that book, uh, helped me come to terms with the philosophy I had read here as an undergrad at Valpo with my own maturing theological understanding of faith. But many are aware of his work, perhaps some of you, through his Cultural Liturgies trilogy, uh, which I notice is now available in a box set, kind of like Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Um, just like that, yeah. That has gone a long way to reform our public theology in the light of the ancient future reign of Christ. But if you are unfamiliar with Jamie Smith, allow me this hot take. For my money, he is one of the most thoughtful Christian public intellectuals thinking today, right up there with people like Tish Harrison Warren and Esau McCulley. The only difference is that he has not yet acquiesced to allowing any of his words to be published on the op-ed page of the New York Times. A generation ago, another person who is no stranger to Valparaiso University, Martin Marty, 
could occupy a broad space to practice the art of being a Christian public intellectual. Like Marty, Jamie Smith operates by a broad generosity of spirit. He remembers people's names and how he knows them, and he can just as easily talk about skateboarding as St. Augustine. But unlike the post-World War II heyday of American optimism, the space at the nexus of those three words, an intellectual who is public, who is Christian, is not what it used to be. Which is perhaps why Jamie's work has moved from focusing on the space in which a witness to faith takes place to the time in which it happens. Which is perhaps why he no longer asks the question, where are you? But in his most recent book, How to Inhabit Time, when are you? It's that question that led this Institute of Liturgical Studies this year to invite him to help us all find an answer. If I may, I'd like to quote from the book directly when Dr. Smith speaks of a temporal delusion that he calls no when. Get it? Not nowhere, but no when. He writes, those who imagine they inhabit no when imagine themselves wholly governed by timeless principles, unchanging convictions, expressing an idealism that assumes they are wholly governed by eternal ideas untainted by history. Know anybody like that? I do. <laughs> they are oblivious to the deposits of history in their own unconscious. They have never considered the archaeological strata in their own souls. They live as if hatched rather than born. That's nice. Created ex nihilo rather than formed by a process. They don't realize that the homes that formed them were clocks. They can't hear the ticking. Where such an eternal no when rules, time doesn't matter. This temporal delusion characterizes too much of Christianity and too many, Ameri too many Christians and not a few Americans. Sisters and brothers, to wake us up from all our temporal delusions, please welcome James K.A. Smith. Thank you so much, Travis. Way, way too generous. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, you will have to bear with me one moment because I have zero tech skills, but I do want to try to use some slides. Look at me. I, I you know, I still kind of prefer chalk. Uh, it's hard to find blackboards anymore, but uh, uh, it's really a pleasure and an honor to be here. I, I have uh, known of the Institute of Liturgical Studies for a long time. It's um, always been understood as something of a kind of sister entity uh, to the Calvin Institute of Christian Worship, which is uh, uh, where uh, I call home. And uh, so it's a treat to see the conversation here. I, I think the theme... Um, not only because it became an occasion to invite me, but I, I do think this theme is really timely, and I thought the formulation of the theme when I received the invitation was just uh, um, such a cogent theological expression of, of what the church needs to be doing and thinking about uh, right now. So I'm, I, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I want to... Um, can you all hear me okay? Okay. I'm, I'm kind of getting used to Britney Spears mics, so I feel like I'm a long ways away from you. And I also need to figure out how to work PowerPoint. How, how would I make this advance? With the space bar? There we go. In some ways, what I want to meditate with you on this morning is really 
all just a footnote to this uh, wonderful insight from the liberation theologian Gustav, Gustavo Gutierrez. To hope in Christ is at the same time to believe in the adventure of history. And I want us to think this morning a bit about what it means to accept God's invitation to this spiritual adventure that is history. And I think that requires that we think carefully about the ways and why time matters for the Christian life. And I hope in our conversations uh, today, it will spill over in particular into a reflection perhaps on the ways and why time matters for a liturgical life. And for those of you especially who have responsibility for liturgical leadership. The question that arises for us is the question that uh, Travis already noted. In some ways, I want us to think about not where are we, but when are we? And I know the grammar feels very strange in that question, but it is a question, it's a different question of orientation. We're used to orienting ourselves in space. What I think we are less adept at or accustomed to is trying to orient ourselves in time, and in particular, orienting ourselves in the sweep of history. And so with you today, I want to think about why when makes a difference. And to ask this question, when are we, I want to suggest, is one of the most fundamental questions of discipleship and of spiritual formation. Now, to ask this, this slightly strange question is going to require a different sort of attunement to our souls, to the body of Christ, to our surroundings. And so I do want to spend some time this morning um, doing some work that might feel slightly strange for us. I want to do a, a kind of a social and spiritual and cultural analysis of the way we experience time and the way we have been taught to relate to history particularly in modernity, and then I would say perhaps especially intensely in forms of American modernity. And I think we partly have to take stock of and get a, we have to grapple with the, the way in which we have been trained subtly, covertly, stealthily to uh, uh, inhabit history in disordered ways, in uh, um, death-dealing ways in some ways, and what it, then, then we will pivot to imagine what it would look like to live and inhabit time differently. But the founding conviction here is that any authentic spirituality must be rooted in a deep sense of our creaturehood. That's my starting point. That we need to think through the, the uh, dynamics of a spirituality that is rooted in our creaturehood. I think the most powerful the most um, illuminating, the most helpful visions of the Christian life from ancient desert dwellers to 20th century uh, um, uh, giants like Nowen and Merton are all acutely attuned to our finitude. They are forms of spirituality that are attuned to our finitude. Merton once said that Way too many works of spiritual counsel amount to instructions for how to be an angel. That has been my experience as well. And so when you, when you encounter spiritual visions and, and visions of spiritual formation and practice that actually uh, um, are attentive to our finitude and our embodiment, our materiality, our sociality, they, they sort of, uh, um, they pop, if you will, because they make sense for us. We can put them on. They are not spirituality for angels because in Jesus Christ, God did not become an angel. God became human. And the only spirituality that could promise any hope or wisdom for us has to be a spirituality for humans, for creatures. So here's the fundamental conviction I want us to work out this morning. A spirituality for creatures must be a spirituality that is attuned to time and history. To be human is to be conditioned by time, shaped by history. We don't float above the flux. 
We humans are those unique creatures who are shaped by history even as we shape history. Actually, Niebuhr was really, really uh, uh, insightful about the ironies of this kind of situation in which we find ourselves. So we are we have agency, we are actors, we shape history, but in fact, even our endeavors to shape history are the effects of how history has shaped us. And we need to think through the implications of that for spiritual formation. I think one of the reasons why trying to get a handle on this can sometimes feel strange for us is um, because there are so many cultural forces that have uh, uh, subtly trained us to imagine otherwise. And so I think we need to undertake something of a diagnosis of those forms of Christianity that many of us have perhaps absorbed unawares simply by kind of swimming in the waters of the United States. Uh, there is a sense in which, or at least even if I, I'm, so I should tell you, I'm a Canadian immigrant but I did become a citizen in 2018. So I'm in this mess with you, okay? I'm, I'm, don't, I'm not taking pot shots from outside. Uh, um, in some ways, I, I do think part of what I wanna think through are some of the dynamics of that strange water we swim in that is US Christianity. On the other hand, I do also think it's just part of the features of modernity, of sort of inhabiting a world shaped by late capitalism and so forth. We, the way I want us to think about this is we inhabit contested modes of timekeeping. We always live at the intersection, the overlapping sort of Venn diagram space of different modes of timekeeping. Our lives are organized by rival calendars. And hence, we are actually multiply and incessantly absorbing competing conceptions of time and history and how we relate to them. So I want to suggest that there's something in the water of either American culture and or modern culture that then seeps into a lot of forms of American Christianity, even those forms, by the way, that pride themselves on how countercultural they are. I think one of the effects of the way we experience time in modernity is that we are subtly trained to imagine that we are ahistorical and supratemporal, that is above time. That there are certain, sorry, if you invite a philosopher, we're gonna do big, crazy stuff in the morning. Uh, um, now, I think that, so this sense, this kind of covert, subtle, but powerful sense that we are immune to, above the flux, atemporal or ahistorical or supertemporal, I think this probably stems from a certain overconfidence either in our own ingenuity or our own willpower, that we are just these pure agents who can always remake the world in any moment and so our past, we're not, our past doesn't matter for us. Or it could also be the sense that we uh, believe in some forms of Christianity that we are so hooked up to eternity that we have escaped the taint of history. Whatever might be the case, what the result of this kind of curious, strange, I would say disincarnate understanding of how we relate to time and history creates the kind of temporal disorientation that makes us uh, um, inhabit time badly, poorly, in a disordered way, that stems from this illusion of being above the fray or immune to history or surfing time rather than immersed in the sea of time. And I want us to, this is, this is, uh, um, Travis stole a little bit of my thunder here this morning. I'm just going to tell you. I'm just teasing. Uh, this is what I'm going to call forms of know-when Christianity. I don't know how much you all, um, in philosophy, we talk about people who claim to have a view from nowhere. Has anybody ever heard that phrase before? So somebody who claims to have a view from nowhere imagines, it's almost like they have a God's eye view of things, right? And they're, they don't have a perspective. They see 
the way things are. If you ever meet somebody who thinks they have a view from nowhere, run. <laughs> but a lot, a lot of people functionally believe that they kind of have this view from nowhere uh, that is not contextual, that is not located, that is not per perspectival, as if they were above it all. Well, now what I'm suggesting is there is a temporal correlate to that, which is a view from no when. In no when Christianity, it is this form of disorientation. It's actually a form of disorientation, I want us to appreciate, that stems from the illusion that we are unconditioned by time. So, so those who imagine they inhabit this no when, as, as uh, 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 Travis already pointed out earlier, what happens is people then believe that they are sort of wholly and fully and only governed by timeless principles in the way that they inhabit the world and they relate to others. They, they imagine that they are simply living out unchanging convictions and they, are, they have sort of located the ideals that should govern exactly how we live. They are oblivious, as we said, to these deposits of history that sort of live in us, often at an unconscious level. And so they are unaware of uh, both the archeologies in their own souls, but also the archeological strata that characterize our social communities and bodies. I should tell you that um, How to Inhabit Time is a book that I only could ever have written because I went through years of counseling and therapy. And, and I mean that very seriously, actually. Like, there's a, there's a, there's a way in which this is a very middle-aged uh, endeavor. It's like, oh, okay, you wake up to a certain... Uh, how old are you? 52. Ah, oh, shocker. Um, so, uh, uh, th but I, I want us to appreciate that there's a social dynamic that plays out this same thing. And what, what I want us to appreciate is uh, um, when you believe that you have this view from no when, when you, when you are so overly confident that you're tapped into the eternal no when, time doesn't matter. There is just not any sense in which the, the, the vagaries and texture and particularity of historical moments matter because the timeless eternal principles that you are connected to are always the same everywhere. The result, I want to suggest, is something like the equivalent of a kind of, this is mixing metaphors, but it's like a temporal tone deafness. That is, it's a failure to appreciate the nuances and dynamics of history. We can't discern why when makes a difference. We don't recognize how much we are the products of a past, which then, this is the important piece, leads to significant naivete about our present. Right? If you don't have an appreciation, if you have the sense that you've been hatched rather than born, then you're going to be utterly naive about actually how much of your past you've brought to the present. We've brought to the present. We also, however, when you have this sort of view of the eternal no when and imagine that you are connected to it and hooked up to it by some sort of direct IV line to the, to the mind, what happens is you also don't really know how to keep time with a promised future. You don't live out the adventure of history, to use Gutierrez's phrase. And so instead what happens is you get sort of fixations on the end times or something like that. I wanna, I wanna risk an example of this. Um, I mean, I leave this afternoon, so whatever, if I offend you. Uh, um, uh, I, I thought a really um, uh, powerful but heartbreaking example of this was the way a lot of American Christians responded to the demand and the assertion and the protest that black lives matter. Now, why, why are we protesting and asserting and demanding that black lives matter? Because we are seeing incessantly all the ways that our society is built institutionally and systemically to act as if they do not. And in the face of that, I don't know if any of you ever heard, like saw bumper stickers or billboards or whatever, the assertion that all lives matter. Now, 
those who protested in the face of the protest that Black Lives Matter, with the claim all lives matter, to me that is a classic example of people sort of evacuating themselves all of a sudden to this sort of universal temporal standpoint, right? This actually supra-temporal standpoint. And, and by the way, it was usually very, very surprising to find all of a sudden the folks who said all lives matter cared about universal solidarity of human beings. <laughs> we hadn't heard that before. What, what I just want to point out is, uh, is that, in a sense, that kind of evacuation to a supra-temporal reality is actually a way of evading the particularity of the history that required this protest here, now, in this place, because of this past. So in that sense, it's a form of temporal delusion a form of temporal disorientation that leads to naivete, and at a social level, naivete is often so dangerous. Now, I think we could, we could talk about, uh, how are we doing, okay? Yeah. All right, so there are relate, th that's the broad, this sort of form of know when Christianity, and, and again, what I wanna emphasize is because this is sort of in the water, the cultural water we drink, don't be surprised at the subtle ways that all of us absorb this in ways that we need to take stock of. We might have much better theologies than this. It doesn't mean that we haven't actually subtly absorbed something like this orientation just by swimming in the pool. Um, now, I, I, wanna, I wanna talk about two other what I'm gonna call temporal temptations of no when Christianity that might also help us to see some, I think these are particular temptations for religious communities in the face of how we inhabit time. The first is, um, well, let, let me, um, I'll do this a little bit autobiographically. So I did not grow up in the church or a Christian home. I became a Christian when I was 18 through a little missionary dating We've now been married for 32 years, so. <laughs> uh, um, but also um, through uh, um, uh, my portal into the body of Christ was, was quite a f kind of fundamentalist sect who uh, um, were fixated on Bible prophecy, okay? Don't judge me. Um, and, and it was in 1988 and uh, I don't know if anybody ever saw a little tract going around at the time that was called 88 Reasons for 1988. Can you imagine 88 Reasons for what in 1988? The rapture. Here's the list of reasons why Jesus is coming in 1988. You, you, you get how it goes. That portal into Christianity for me is probably I'm doing a little bit of therapy with you right now. I'm still kind of working this out. But it, it was a portal into a form of Christianity that I think some of us, you know, in sort of smells and bells, mainline Christianity forget is a very dominant form of American Christianity. And when I became a Christian at a tiny little country chapel in Southern Ontario, the basement of the fellowship hall had a massive banner that was this hung across the wall, and all of our Bible studies happened in light of this. I don't know if you, you, you I, I'm kind of jealous if you've never seen this before, honestly. This is one of Clarence Larkin's famous dispensationalist charts. And what I, what I just want to meditate on with you for a moment is, I want, it, it, you'll notice, by the way, that this is the 7,000 years of human history. They're very confident in the math. And um, the other thing that you'll notice is, well, what, what I want us to appreciate is, on the one hand, you could see how this looks like a form of Christianity that is actually really interested in history. Do you know what I mean? Like, they've mapped the entirety of human history. And they even are sort of, they are laying out and projecting where history is going. And so in so many ways, 
uh, um, this form of, of rapture-ready dispensationalist Christianity, which is such a dominant note in American Christianity, on the one hand, looks like a form of Christianity that is absorbed by and fascinated by history. But what I want to suggest is that, in fact, the charts and predictions and the big overview and the ability to be able to see all of this is a sign that it's a form of Christianity that believes it's above history, that it has a view from no when, that it has the God's eye view where it can see the whole. And, and more importantly, the way we learn to relate to history in this form is that history is the regrettable grind of waiting for the escape, right? It actually, as a theology of history, it does not have anything positive to say about God's activity in history other than bringing it to its end. And that I want, to, want us to, I mean, you all know this, but I, I guess I just want us to appreciate how fundamentally uh, um, unorthodox <laughs> such a view of God's activity in history is. In fact, I don't know if you'll notice this, but uh, um, you can see classic Dark Ages right here. So in, in this take, a vast swath of the history of the body of Christ is consigned to the Dark Ages in ways that Enlightenment, secularist Enlightenment thinkers never would have dreamed. So there is a fundamental aspersion of even the sense that the Spirit has been active in the history of the church. Instead, what you get is these long chunks of history, including this long phase of history of Christianity between the death of the apostles and, by the way, the momentous insights of John Nelson Darby in 1828. Basically, everything between then is Ichabod. God has left the building. Instead of discerning history, dispensationalism is a no-when Christianity that actually mostly demonizes history. And so one form of know-when Christianity manifests itself as this kind of end times fixation that has no place to imagine why God gives us time and history as a gift, as something that we need, like air for a relationship with God to unfold. It's also why such forms of Christianity lack any sense of a cultural call to the moment, to the specificity of the moment. Instead, it's just incessantly offering tickets to an escape pod from history, from this Ichabod space. Now, I think you can see the same sort of evasion of time and history in other kind of dynamics of American Christianity that uh, um, seep into the water for us. The, the first is what I'll call primitivism. Has anybody ever heard the term used? Some, some historians of American uh, uh, Christianity talk about it this way. Primitivism is a curious view of history that sees God's presence as limited to only select and almost always early points in history. And most importantly, primitivist Christianities assume that the spirit was present in the first century and then somehow absent and forgotten for the long intervening centuries until someone, usually the leader of their sect, rediscovered the truth in often the 19th century, say, and then spawned a renewal movement that recovered the original primitive truth. Does this sound familiar? To, this, is, this is the trope of so much of the water of our experience of American Christianity. The other way we could describe it is revivalism. And, and one of the things that has come to interest me is the way in which revivalism um, is so kind of built into the modern American experience that it doesn't even always have to be religious, right? There can be sort of secular revivalisms that work in the same way. So such primitivism, revivalism, again, writes off these vast swaths of history as devoid of God's presence 
because that history doesn't seem to conform to their contemporary version of the original. What I want us to appreciate is how fundamentally un- and anti-Catholic such a conception of history is. Not, not we, I, again, I think we have a little bit of a habit of imagining Catholicity geographically and spatially, which is, yes, true, good, absolutely. What would it mean to understand Catholicity temporally, historically? I think at the heart of Catholicity as a theology of history is this deep conviction that Jesus' promise that the Spirit would guide us into all truth is a spirit that remains operative for the entire life of the body of Christ. And so whenever we are characterized by this primitivism, this revivalism, this kind of return and restorationist movement, what we are effectively doing is spurning the gifts of the spirit that have been bequeathed to us in the intervening centuries. Now, of course, there are... Uh, um, well, let, let, me, let, me, let me note one more, and then we'll, we'll turn to something more constructive. This, another sort of form of this kind of uh, um, temporal dyschronometria is the condition, the way you would talk about it. Uh, this, this form of no-when Christianity that I think is particularly powerful today is nostalgia. I think religious communities are particularly prone to this. And you can partly understand why. Faith, of course, is handed down. It's a matter of traditio. The faith is handed down from generations before. And so you can partly understand how and why faithfulness might be confused with preserving the past rather than having gratitude for a legacy meant to propel us forward. Do you see those two different modes of being oriented to and related to what is handed down? Nostalgia, I'm suggesting, is a form of relating to the past, which imagines that the way to receive the past is to keep repristinating it. It's a primarily concerned with preservation. Whereas a more faithful, dynamic sense of still inheriting those good gifts of the tradition is to actually see them as launching pads for living forwards. I think the most significant problem with nostalgia is not that it remembers. That is enjoined as part of a faithful life. The problem with nostalgia isn't that it remembers. The problem with nostalgia is what it forgets. I love this quote from, um, there, there's a remarkable um, memoir of uh, Shackleton's failed Antarctic exposition. The title kind of gives it away. It's called The Worst Journey in the World. <laughs> it's like 800 pages long by Cherry Apsley Gerard. And in the middle of that, he has this brilliant insight. So much of the trouble of this world is caused by memories, for we only remember half. The past that is pined for in nostalgia is always selected, edited, preserved in amber, and so decontextualized. Whenever the past is sort of invoked nostalgically as a template for the present, the very first question we should always ask is, whose past? Whose past? Whose rendition? Whose version? Whose editing? Whose selection? And what does this invoked past ignore, override, and actively forget? Which half is recalled? Which half is forgotten? Nostalgia is a sentimental pining for the way it was. And such nostalgia is always a form of arrested development. So for example, there are um, sorts of nostalgia that are not so subtle longings for adolescence. I don't know if you've, because now I'm just thinking of broader cultural realities. Are you guys also seeing advertisements for adult proms? 
Has anybody ever seen this? This is, this is a growing sort of industry where being marketed to 30 and 40 year olds is that they can go and relive their high school prom. This is not a recipe for the advancement of the race. <laughs> but it is all part of this kind of collective nostalgic bent. In most cases, and I think especially in our collective life, Nostalgia usually serves a social and political agenda that wants to reprise a configuration of society that secured a way of life that's being romanticized. And of course, all too often, that way of life benefited some. You know, it, it, do you remember when Mad Men was on, you know, 10 years ago or something? And it was sumptuous and gorgeous, and the suits were great, and the whole aesthetic, and it made me want to smoke. And oh, you know, it's like it, it's fantastic. Only a white man could say, "Oh, those were the days." Only, right? Because everybody else is getting ground underfoot in the United States. Yeah. So. Now, I would say, I'm trying to think mostly with you on a kind of collective and social uh, level. I do think that there are forms of personal nostalgia that can also be corrupting of a spiritual life. I think some of us, maybe, maybe, maybe especially those of us who've had kind of evangelical experiences in the past, you can fall into the trap of sort of like holding out that first emotional, enthusiastic form of your relationship with Jesus as the really, truly authentic form of being a follower of Jesus. And now you spend the rest of your life feeling guilty that you're not so happy clappy for Jesus anymore. That kind of personal spiritual nostalgia is, I think, really, really uh, dangerous and harmful for mat spiritual maturity. So you can see these forms of kind of know when uh, uh, spill over into forms of American Christianity that we sort of swim amongst and in and that we absorb. It can lead to uh, nostalgia. It can lead to this sort of revivalism and primitivism. It can lead to all kinds of forms of disordered relationships to history. What do we do in response? These forms of temporal temptation are all forms of evading time in history as if we are trying to escape our creaturehood by making ourselves immune to history. I want us to realize that if we are allergic to history, or if we resent time, we are actually avoiding one of the primary ways and sites and arenas in which God meets us. If we have this disordered relationship and evasion of time and history, we are basically not accepting the invitation to the spiritual adventure that Gutierrez was talking about. So instead, I want us to think about what we'll call spiritual timekeeping. And I'm going to, I'm playing, I might have made up a phrase here, memento tempore. Right? Remember, memento mori, remember you are mortal, remember you will die. Memento tempore, remember you are temporal, remember you inhabit history. Remembering you are mortal is a big piece of that, which we could talk about later, but I want to think through some of the aspects of what we'll call spiritual timekeeping in contrast to these other forms. Spiritual maturity requires what I'm calling spiritual timekeeping. This is not about what to do spiritually with your time, okay? So this is, this is not a program. Um, and it's, it's certainly not about spiritualized time management. That's not what I'm talking about. Spiritual timekeeping is a renewed temporal awareness that is attuned to the textures of history, the vicissitudes of life, and the tempo of the spirit. Spiritual timekeeping is rooted in a wake-up call to the significance of our temporality, the, the, the significance of our personal histories, but also our collective temporality. It awakens us to the way that history lives in us and the way we inhabit history and time and are shaped by it. It's not as simple as seeing the spiritual significance of your calendar, but rather discerning this is going to be the watchword now going forward, discernment. 
Spiritual timekeeping is fundamentally about discerning the spiritual repercussions of the history that precedes us, that lives in us, so that we can hear and discern and respond to the future that God is calling us to. So spiritual timekeeping has these three beats, reckoning, discernment, and hope. Reckoning, discernment, and hope. And the question that we're asking ourselves is what does it mean to be faithful if we are creatures of history and conditioned by time? In some ways, I think in uh, um, the language of faithfulness has been significantly co-opted by disordered conceptions of time and history. I want us to sort of loosen this up, think about it differently. What does it mean to be faithful if we are creatures of history and we are conditioned by time? In no when forms of Christianity, the watchword for faithfulness is preservation. So faithfulness is understood as the prolongation and preservation of what has been. In these forms of no-when Christianity, faithfulness is almost always a matter of guarding against change, which is mostly feared. In contrast, in spiritual timekeeping, the watchword is discernment. Faithfulness requires knowing when we are in order to discern what we are called to. The goal of spiritual confrontation with our past is precisely to rid us of our delusions and idolatries so that we can finally hear what God is calling us to in the present. And so recall Gutierrez's wonderful point, to hope in Christ is at the same time to believe in the adventure of history. In spiritual timekeeping, life with God is an adventure because our relationship keeps unfolding in new ways. So in contrast to primitivism, Jesus promises a dynamic work of the Spirit who guides us into truth across time. This is the fundamental conviction of Catholicity. The Spirit continues to guide and lead into the future, across history, still guiding, convicting, illuminating, and revealing, which is precisely why ongoing reform and change and transformation is necessary. I, I was telling, we, we had a seminar yesterday afternoon, and um, as, as a maybe one concrete expression of this, um, uh, Rita Felsky uh, is a literary critic who wrote this really interesting book called Hooked, where she talks about the dynamics of what she calls affective climate change. Affective climate change. What she means is your affections are sort of your, your emotional heartstring responses to works of art. And one of the things that interests her is the way in which the same work of art, it could be a painting, a film, a song, a poem, the same work of art you could encounter multiple times over time. And the work of art never changes. But your response to it, all of a sudden, at some point, it's like you've just heard this song for the first time yourself. Has anybody ever had an experience like this? Interestingly, one of the sociologists that studied this focused on the music of Bruce Springsteen. So, middle-aged white dude stuff in advance, okay? <laughs> Trigger warning. So... Uh, um, I was a teenager in the 80s. The boss was kind of like in the air. Do you know what I mean? Like born in the USA, big album, uh, um, dancing in the dark, landmark video on MTV. Courtney Cox gets pulled up on the stage. They're dancing, you know, this. But it's like I would never have been a Bruce Springsteen fan. Do you know what I mean? Like that's not doing it for me. Can we talk about Bruce Springsteen when you're doing all this Bach and things? Okay, all right. Uh, um, he was the boss. He's the boss. By the way, his, his, his memoir, Born to Run, is an absolute Augustinian meditation <laughs> on the complexity of human longing, I, I will just say. <laughs> um, uh, but what, what I then found was, you know, shocker, you hit like 49.50. 
And you keep, you've been listening to the music the whole time. And I remember the moment where I'm listening to his earlier album, Nebraska, which was probably like early 80s, maybe in, yeah, maybe around 80 or something like that, 82. It's 40 years old almost. I'm listening to it and it's like in my father's house and I, I, this guy has like read my mail. Do you know what I mean? It's like he's put this scope directly into my soul and I am sobbing in the kitchen because all of a sudden Bruce Springsteen has given me an articulation of all of the brokenness and longing that I've been living with for an entire lifetime and that album has been around for decades. The song didn't change. I changed. My, what Felsky would say is my affective capacity to be able to receive the song was transformed because my uh, um, ongoing dynamic history, I'm a different person than I was when I was 14 or 15. Um, that, that kind of insight, I think, also hit me a couple of Easter's ago when I heard uh, uh, the gospel reading, John chapter 16, Upper Room Discourse, Jesus says, I have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. I have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. And I realized part of God's compassionate response to our temporality is to sometimes keep stuff back <laughs> until we become the people with the capacity to receive the gifts that God wants to give. Does that make sense? And so part of one of the reasons why history is a spiritual adventure is because we individually, but also we collectively, are growing in the Spirit's time to become the kind of people for whom Jesus can keep giving us new things. I have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now, which is precisely why in that exact same passage, he promises that the Spirit will guide us into all truth. That, to me, is the heart of Catholicity. And at this, in that picture, Catholicity is fundamentally about dynamism, not stasis. Catholicity is fundamentally about attention and availability to the Spirit, not preservation and repristination. We have to appreciate all of the ways that our history with God comes with us, but the story is still unfolding. Listening to the Spirit is not just some archaeological dig looking for the original deposit. It is rather an attunement to a God who is with us. I want us to hear the name Emmanuel not only as a name of spatial proximity, but also as a name of temp temporal covenant partnership of God with us. When God says, my name is Emmanuel, he will be called Emmanuel, God with us, that is an expression of covenant faithfulness across time and the reliability of God's spirit to be speaking, still surprising, still revealing. It's more like listening for the Spirit is like listening for what God can build given the layers beneath us. It's not digging back to the original project, a deposit. It's actually seeing the foundation that has accrued and therefore what God can build for the future. In the end, spiritual timekeeping is about keeping time with the Spirit. And keeping time with the Spirit is not some regi regimental march, left, right, left, right, ad infinitum. Keeping time with the Spirit is more like a subtle dance. It's a responsive feel for what comes next. Or you could think of it as the way a song unfolds. I read a great little book from the 50s by Lionel Salter called How to Go to a Concert. <laughs> it's really, it's like, yeah, that's helpful. Uh, um, and, he's, and he's picturing, by the way, a, a, a symphony concert. And in this book, he describes the conductor's role in an orchestra. The conductor, he says, 
has to judge the proper tempo of the work and indicate it clearly to the orchestra by movements of the baton. But that is not just a mechanical process because what the music requires of the orchestra changes over the course of the symphony. If the tempo were really just a mechanical factor of timekeeping, Salter says you could just sort of, uh, uh, it'd be sufficient to play the orchestra a couple of ticks from a metronome, or as sometimes in a dance band say, one, two, one, two, and then set the right tempo for the whole piece. But of course, that's not what happens with an orchestra, because playing the symphony well requires different timing across the course of the work. One of the beauties of music, he says, lies in the subtle variations of pace, the urging on, the yielding, the big broadening. The conductor is helping the entire orchestra to become attuned to these subtleties. So too must the church and we in our individual lives be attuned to the living spirits conducting in ways that are responsive to the moment, when to urge on, when to yield. Such discernment is true for the collective body of Christ in its communal witness and mission, and these dynamics are true also in our own spiritual lives. We are listening for the Spirit to recognize seasons of a life with God, for example, when the Spirit sometimes speaks sotto voce, almost inaudibly, and to discern what God asks of us in every season, what God is doing in us and through us and wants us to realize for our neighbors. I want to close with a prayer I once heard at a, a congregation in D.C. This is a post-communion prayer from the Anglican Church of Kenya. And I, I, um, I, I, I wanted to finish this way because of the gospel text that we heard yesterday, the Thomas text, which is so stirring and, and a beautiful reflection on it last evening. And I'm, I'm thinking about this in terms of the wounds, the scars of the resurrected Christ, which is everything you need to know about God's theology of history. Everything you need to know about God's theology of time is embodied and manifested in the scars of the resurrected Christ, that God's new creation does not erase history or evade history but rather takes it up in the surprise of the resurrection. And so perhaps this could be our closing prayer. O God of our ancestors, God of our people, before whose face the human generations pass away, we thank you that in you we are kept safe forever and that the broken fragments of our history are gathered up in the redeeming act of your dear son, remembered in this holy sacrament of bread and wine. Let us be the mosaic that God is making for the world. Thanks very much. I think we'll just leave that prayer up for a while. Um, uh, I know I have a ton of questions, and so uh, we will be gathering again for those of you who are interested in engaging Jamie in more conversation in this room after our break, but that is also the time of more workshops, which I believe begin at 1045, right? And now we have a little bit of a break. Stand up and, and uh, wake up, as Jamie has called us to, and gather back again wherever you choose to be at 1045. Thank you. <laughs>